Well, good evening, everybody. Um, my guest tonight is Caroline Kurtz. Caroline grew up in Ethiopia. Uh, I'm going to ask her about her very exciting life as a youngster there. Caroline also happened to be in Addis Ababa in 1994 when um, the big upheaval that is very similar to the one that we're seeing now happened. She had lived through a number of other attempted coups there in Ethiopia. Um, but more importantly, I think the reason why I've asked her to, to be here tonight is she has written this amazing book, which actually gives us a lot of history on Ethiopia. And after the book and during writing the book, she still is involved with work in Ethiopia. She's got friends in Ethiopia as we speak. She's got uh, staff members of the organizations that she's working with in Ethiopia. And so um, I don't think there are many other people who are better qualified to tell us more about the situation happening in Ethiopia right now. Caroline Kurtz, welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining Litnet tonight. Um, and thanks for agreeing to speak to me. Well, I want to begin by saying that it is me as a white American foreigner to be commenting on the situation in Ethiopia. And I do so very humbly, but I do so as someone who cares a great deal about Ethiopia in the broader, in general. And also I have friends and loved ones in Ethiopia and from Ethiopia. So I have a little, what I do offer is a love of history, experiences from a young age in Ethiopia, and a continuing relationship with Ethiopia and Ethiopians. And hopefully my foreign outsider point of view is is different from an insider and has both advantages and disadvantages. So I will try not to um, assume my advantages are higher than they are, but also not uh, downgrade my uh, my disadvantages as being an outsider. I, I do. So, um, I, sorry, I do just want to say one of the reasons why I can speak to you is you are not in Ethiopia at the moment, and therefore you are safe. Um, it is an advantage, um, but um, you have actually been in Ethiopia during some very turbulent times. Um, but, but do continue, please. I don't. Um, um, I would like to hear well, what you're saying. Yeah, I I am um, relying on news reports as we all are, but I also have conversations by Skype to phone with friends in Ethiopia or by uh, WhatsApp. And also I happen to have a friend who came out um, in late October and has delayed her return to Ethiopia, but who usually lives in Ethiopia, whose family is mostly um, still in Ethiopia. So I have conversations with her and she of course is deeply connected with her friends. The, the complexity of the situation when I read the news reports the complexity of it escapes, is not covered. I, I get a piece and I go, oh yeah, from one article and another small piece from another. But I fear that most people who are seeing the news, those little bits of complexity um, generally escape them. So um, right now, both uh, American and African leaders are working very hard to try to stop Ethiopia for tumbling, from tumbling into a full out civil war. What I don't see reflected in the news and I hear both from my Ethiopian friends, um, well, mostly from my Ethiopian friends and also just from my basic knowledge is that the, um, the militia, from the Tigray province that's marching on the capital and the coalition, which is being announced, you know, they now have a coalition of nine other, basically these are local militias that are together. They are still a minority, a okay. deep minority in Ethiopia. That is not being reflected in the news. You saw a little bit of that this weekend when there were demonstrations in Addis Ababa. 
the difference between 1991 when I was there and the Tigray, the TPLF marched on Addis Ababa and took the government is that the government had become extremely unpopular, extremely unpopular. And um, Mangistu Haile Mariam, the, the um, prime minister had fled in fact a week before. Yeah. And so people were relieved that someone was going to take hold although there was a lot of um, fear that it was not going to end up well. There was, there was anxiety, but it seemed like possibly this is very different. 30 years later, we are 30 years later, uh, the Tigray uh, powers, it's the power brokers, it's not the people, but the Tigray power brokers who were in control for 30 years have, have been undermining the new government as soon as they began to lose control. And they have coalesced with extremists from several different ethnic groups who want to secede from Ethiopia or who want to break up Ethiopia in some very radical ways. But even the coalition of nine local militia plus the Tigray is still a deep minority. And most Ethiopians that I talk to are favoring with all of its flaws, favoring the present government and the direction that he was taking Ethiopia in. So that's a very, that's much more volatile than it was in 91. I, I certainly, that, that is something that I certainly did not pick up in my reading. Um, and that's wonderful to hear that from you. Um, just on a, on a practical note, at the moment, Ethiopia is actually a confederation or a federation. There is, it, is it very similar in setup of like the United States? Because, I mean, you, you're referring to the Tigray province, which is very, very high up north. <clears throat> and then, of course, Addis Ababa is much more down in the south. Um, and then there are various ethnicities. Um, it's a huge country, by the way, more than 100 million people. Um, and as I understand it, uh, there are quite a number of provinces in some confederation. Now, you're talking about breaking that up. Um, what, what is the situation like? I mean, I understand a little bit from South Africa, a little bit about what's happening in the United States. Is it similar or is it different in, in setup from the United States um, and the federation there? Well, it's again, this goes back to the government that the Tigray, the TPLF and their coalition EPRDF set up in 91, 92, 93 yes. as they, they formed a new um, constitution yes. and, and they changed all the states. Like imagine taking the United States or taking South Africa and saying, we're erasing all the borders of all the states and we're redrawing them. So they redrew all the state lines in Ethiopia and they redrew them according to historic and traditional territories of ethnic peoples. Oh, okay. So all of the states in Ethiopia, and it's the only country in the world that I know of that's this way, are based on ethnicity. So you have the Tigray people state, which is Tigray. You have the Amhara people state, which is Amhara, the Afar people state. There are 80 different ethnic groups in Ethiopia and 52 of them are collected in a Southern state, which is where I, I still work in development. Um, one of those ethnicities just broke off and created their own state. And they are actually larger in number than the Tigray people. Just to okay. give you a sense of the minority, the Tigray are, are usually assumed to be about 7, 0.7% of the population of Ethiopia. They are a very small ethnic group. So when they marched down from the north in 91 and took the government, part of the fear was they are such a small minority. And indeed, it was a very repressive government. In order to hold power with that much of a minority, they had to be repressive and they also had to divide and conquer. That's what happened is that Ethiopians had a sense of being Ethiopian. They had a sense of the, their historic ethnicity. There 
marriage. There was lots of movement around Ethiopia so that people from one ethnicity were living generations in another area. Um, all of that had happened, but when these divisions by ethnic, by ethnicity happened, a huge amount of ethnic resentment was built up. And if you can imagine, every single one of these state borders mm -hmm. became a disputed border. Mm -hmm. So you had border wars going on within the country and lots of ethnic tension and people being kicked out of an area where they for generations had lived, but they were not ethnically traditionally from that area. So that level of ethnic tension was just built up and built up and built up over these 30 years. So that's another foundational piece of the complexity. The other one that I never see in the news, and I just want to be sure to fit it in here, is that no one is mentioning that I've seen, I saw it in one place, that over these 30 years of the Tigray people, the TPLF formed government being in power, um, all of the all of the military leaders of the country were Tigrayan. Really, I didn't realize that. Yeah. And when this broke out, the, many of the generals, like almost all of the generals, were Tigrayan. When this conflict between the federal state and the state of Tigray broke out, many of the generals changed sides. And so when you oh. see the Ethiopian army collapsing and, and being inadequate to stand up, part of it is that it was gutted leadership wise by, this, um, by the, the ethnic loyalties of many of the uh, Tigrayan military leaders. So it looks to an outsider like maybe, maybe it's um, you know, incompetent, maybe it's, maybe the government isn't actually well supported by the military, but it, again, it's so much more complex than that. But we see that that's why it's important to have an insider's knowledge, even though you are you know, sitting in the United States, you are just so much more, in touch with 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 the, the the people and the actual happenings and and goings on there, I want to bring in something else now, and this is something that that I've certainly picked up in my reading. Um, Eritrea obviously is a still a very much a sore point in all of this, and 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 I'm going to say it to you how I see it from South Africa, and which is obviously a very jaundiced view, but um, during the previous. Uh, war. I mean, just for those who don't know, I mean, it's basically Eritrea, Eritrea um, after the Second World War, became a protectorate of, of Ethiopia, very much like Namibia was to South Africa for a long time. Namibia has gained independence, and um, after a long and fairly disputed war, so has Eritrea. But, but, but there was still actually quite a war going on until the present um, uh, pre, uh, the present um, prime minister of Ethiopia actually um, stopped all of that. In uh, he actually went to Eritrea and he actually broke a peace. And for that, he actually won the Nobel Peace Prize in 1991. But but Caroline, one of the things that I find interesting is that it somehow seems to me that the the, the ongoing border war. You've just mentioned that word for an internal one, but there still seems to be a um, and has actually been for quite a while uh, a dispute on the actual border of, between Ethiopia and, and Eritrea. And, and some of the Western um, powers seems to think that Eritrea is actually feeding the, the Tigray people at the moment. Is, is that correct or is that a wrong, uh, wrong assumption? Well, again, the, the issue with Eritrea goes back many, many, many years, tremendous complexity and deep um, ethnic uh, problems. Um, like you said, it was, it was joined with Ethiopia as a protectorate or a federation, but His, um, His Majesty Haile Selassie really treated it like spoils of war in a way, gave away territory to his loyal generals. And so the conflict with their trees started right after um, the Second World War. It had been an Italian colony. Mm. So uh, Eritrea was a, an Italian colony. It, as, as a Western colony, it split the Tigrayan people. So there 
were Eritreans and Northern mm, Ethiopians, were yes. the same original ethnicity. So you have that. Well, um, Malas Zanawi was the prime minister for most of the years of the Tigrayan um, uh, leadership of Ethiopia. He was a brilliant, um, a brilliant man. He was. He got help from Eritrea in training his guerrillas, and they made an agreement that if the TPLF was able to top, topple um, Mangistu's government, they would allow he would allow um, Eritrea to have its own. Um, um, oh, my my vocabulary is escaping me, um, they would be able to vote on whether they succeed. So it was written into the new constitution that every ethnicity has the power up to and including the power to secede. Okay. So you see some of these extremist groups that are calling for secession, that goes back to that. Well, somehow in, in the subsequent years, this agreement, this agreeable relationship between Malasanawi and Isaias up in Eritrea fell apart and you have this horrible border war. And so you have this buildup, this probably most of 30 year buildup of the animosity. Eritrea is one of the world's most repressive governments. Mm, I have yes. a friend here in Portland, Oregon, who says his brother grew up with Isaias in the same classroom and that he was a bully from childhood. Uh, now yeah, that yeah, may be yeah. apocryphal, but in any case, I think it was probably a huge mistake in my judgment for Ethiopia to ever invite Eritrea in. And Eritrea has been responsible for some of the horrible um, human rights violations and is still um, operant up there in Tigray and is a, a huge, um, extra complication in the whole situation um well yes as, as you say i mean at the moment if you if you look at pen international and other um, human rights bodies that uh, that are press watchdogs then eritrea certainly is is seen as incredibly oppressive whereas yes. i mean in addis ababa you have um the nobel prize winning abi ahmed um who actually brokered peace, who actually went into Eritrea and said, guys, we really need to stop this. Um, and, and now all of that seems to be falling apart. But again, is that, is, is that really just a small minority, as you say, or is it actually, I, I don't know, is it, is it driven by the Eritrean government? Um, is it, um, I, I, I just, I just couldn't quite understand why all of a sudden the flare up again. Um, and I mean, that's, this is one of the reasons why I thought somebody with more insight might actually be able to give us as uh, South Africans a better, a better view of what's happening on the ground. Well, I probably can't speak with as much authority because it's so far north and because yes. where my friends live is mostly I understand that almost to the South Sudan border. Yes. Yes. But I will say that that we just have to never underestimate the level of ethnic bitterness that can grow up in areas. And the ethnic bitterness between Eritrea and Tigray has building up and has built up and built up and built up. And when you get that happening and, and the bitterness of Ethiopian, of non-Tigrayan Ethiopians has built up over 30 years toward Tigrayans. And it's the hegemony, it's the power brokers. This is the power brokers of the Tigray. They, Mullis was a brilliant man. He, he ruled by being repressive and by divide and conquer with all the other ethnicities. When he died, they put in a man who was clearly, everybody knew he was a puppet. So for, I don't know, maybe five or seven, eight years, the Tigrayan powers behind the throne, even though they lost their brilliant prime minister, they were still in power. And it was only when Abi dismantled the, the way the government was running, which had become tremendously unpopular, and there were violent 
demonstrations, building up, building up, building up. And that's why they finally were forced to put in Anand Graham in the prime minister role. And when he began to break up that hegemony of the Tigrayan power brokers, they began to undercut him from that time on. So it's the power brokers, you know, and the fact that the Tigrayan people are suffering has complicated the fact because our hearts go out to the people. And yet the, the issue was, was the spark was sparked, of course, by the power brokers. And there's a saying that I don't know if anybody even knows where it originated in Africa, but when the elephants fight, the grass is trampled. We're, we're yes, seeing- we, we know that the tragedy, as well, yeah. The tragedy of the grass that's being trampled. And we just have to, the, my main, passion is just not to lose track of the fact that it's the power brokers that are causing this problem. Um, and, and, and the West sort of saying that these upstart militias should be, should be treated as though they have a legitimate right to power is, is really offending Ethiopians. Well, that, that is fascinating because I certainly did not pick that up in my reading, and that, that's why it's so important to hear it from, from the ground, so to speak. I, I briefly, uh, I want to actually ask you a little bit about your own background because it is fascinating and it will give readers or, or listeners some insight into why I'm, I'm, uh, I'm interviewing you tonight. But just very briefly, about a year ago, um, after a number of uh, attacks on, on armed forces, um, it looks like Ahmed actually... Uh, send in on the 4th of November 2020, actually launched an attack on, on some of the, well, the militia then in, in, uh, in the Tigray province. And that seems to have sparked and, and now bubbled over into what, what, what seems to be, you know, small pockets of incredible atrocities happening on the ground. Um, the other issue that, that, of course, the Tigrayan people are very specific about is that in 2020 there was supposed to be a general election and because of COVID um, Ahmed said no and they went ahead and had their own election and uh, um, that was another dispute. Um, one of the one of the interesting things is we uh, in South Africa we have the issue of, of uh, um, non-compliance with with the jab but but one of the things that Ahmed apparently promised the people of Ethiopia was that once we've got enough people inoculated we will hold elections um, do you know whether it's possible to jab 102 105 109 million people depending on the on who's counting um, I'm just I'm just asking, and it could be a it could be a difficult one. But I mean, you are you are a, a development worker. You must speak to the aid workers. Is there a possibility of actually getting people jabbed? Just th that's just something that I was curious about. Enough people jabbed soon enough to hold a free and fair election. Well, the election has been held actually. Okay. So it has now been held. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. It okay. has now been held. Um, and. And just to comment on the pandemic, I was struck by is when, um, when there was a spike in India and a friend in Ethiopia texted me and said, I've had one um, shot, I've had one vaccine, but I can't get the second because India was supplying most of the vaccine for Ethiopia. And when India spiked, they began holding their own vaccines and so then there was a shortage of vaccines in Ethiopia. So that to me just was like, wow, global incredible. pandemic. Incredible, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That is fascinating. So the logistics are not only Ethiopian logistics, like there, there's actually quite a good um, clinic system, like small clinics and then larger clinics and then hospitals. And it's been, um, it's been organized pretty well so that it's possible, it seems possible to me that at least the high, and of course the population is deeply concentrated in the mm -hmm. city. Okay. And if yes. cities could be, could be inoculated, then they keep from spreading it to the country. Yes, yes, side. okay. Yeah. But, 
Um, Caroline, I'm 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 quite keen to to actually thank you very much. I I, I, I I've I've learned so much just by listening to you. But I'm I'm quite keen to to hear a little bit. Ooh, I've got it the wrong way around. Um, I'm quite keen to hear a little bit more about this. Um, this is the book that you wrote. Um, it's a fascinating read. Um, and for South Africans, by the way, it is available. You can order it at Bargain Books or any good bookstore. Um, if they struggle, it is being distributed by Pertia at the moment. So just it is available in South Africa. But a road down, a road down both sides. Um, you grew up in the Maji province of Ethiopia. How did uh, you yourself say that a white you know, American girl end up growing up speaking Aramic um, in, uh, in Ethiopia? Well, my dad was a young pastor and just by chance, um, visas were very restricted in Ethiopia, but a missionary in Ethiopia died and my dad got a letter out of the clear blue sky asking if he would consider going to Ethiopia. And my mother had originally thought she might want to travel overseas, which is a freaky thought to me that, that she would have that dream. So I was not quite five when they arrived in Addis Ababa. I had two younger sisters and another one on the way. And after language study, we were assigned um, by partly because of my father's quirky personality to the most remote station of the Presbyterian church in Ethiopia. And that was um, the town of Maji, which is um, very remote. It's maybe as the crow flies, as we say in America, um, maybe only 50 miles from the South Sudan border and very near where Kenya and Sudan and Ethiopia click in. Um, so very, very remote, difficult to get to. My dad was crazy. Why was he taking a wife and four daughters <laughs> down that far away from, um, you know, medical care or anything else? But it was a, a wonderful idyllic childhood. I, as you mentioned, I went to my first, um, I, I had my first political kind of awakening um, when I went to boarding school at age 10 in the capital, Addis Ababa, and there was an attempted coup. So I was away from home for that. And um, that was, my guess to, that, that was my guest to New Way, who was a uh, who, who actually tried to overthrow the His Majesty um, Hail Selassie. Am I correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. So please continue. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I was just it was just a new thought that occurred to me that that might in some ways be the root of my interest in history. And you mentioned that that there's quite a bit of Ethiopian history in my book. Um, over the course of the years that I worked on the book and, and honed my craft, my critique group would say to me, get rid of this history stuff. Just get rid of it. It's, we want your story. We don't want the history. And I was just determined. And what I, what I had to do was learn to write the history in my own voice so that I didn't shift into social studies teacher voice. Yes. Yes. Um, when I was writing the history, and it took me quite a while and quite a lot of revisions, but I was just so stubborn, I felt like my experience in Ethiopia didn't make sense without the history of what was happening in Ethiopia and the history of what had happened in Ethiopia mm -hmm. that was feeding the present history. So that's how I ended up becoming a, a history buff and kind of an <laughs> expert, you know, in, but I mean, it's it's uh, it, it's the way you write it, and I mean, this is fascinating. Is you, you you very much concentrate on your childhood at first, and then you say, "But this has happened." But only later did I learn this, and then so bit by bit, one actually learns a heck of a lot of the even pre Haile Selassie history, um, which is fascinating. And I'm not going to go into that. Please buy the book; it's it's available in South Africa, by the way. But I mean, it's I mean it. It actually is a fantastic book. Um, but but. And then um, just I mentioned earlier that, that I mean, it was so remote that um, your way of getting to school was on the C-43. We call them a Dakota here in South Africa. I mean, you often it was you and two pilots flying over miles of, of just nothingness to go to school. I mean, that, that must have been quite something. 
yeah, you know, looking back and in comparison with kids who are going on a school bus, it's pretty interesting for me. It was just like, okay, this is what's next. You know, it's just my life. So um, I didn't at the time have a sense of it being unique and strange. Um, looking back, of course, I, I'm what my parents put up with and thought was okay. And <laughs> I mean, they, they actually, After they had parents to go through, today, they never do. They, but they themselves had to go through quite a bit of hardship, although seemingly they, and, and I mean, I'm, I'm quite amazed that, I mean, your father was a kind of, you know, gung ho guy. I mean, he he was a he was a, f a glider pilot in the Second World War. I mean, you you can't go more mad than that. But I mean, your mother um, <laughs> seemingly just just was able to cope with all of that. Um, although it, it that must have been interesting. Yeah, they were they were very very interesting people. He was a farm kid. He could do mechanical stuff. He was practical. He was also trained as a pastor. Um, trained as a pilot. Uh, they ended up pulling him into administration. So he had, you know, those kind of gifts, leadership. He was an orator. He um, would come to the States when we were in the States. He would speak in churches and raise thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of dollars for the work there. So, you know, he was a big presence, a big personality. And uh, he spoke Amharic um, not always grammatically correct, but he had a good accent. So people told him that his Amharic was sweet. My mom was grammatically correct, but she stumbled terribly trying to get the grammar right. She was never fluent. Uh, but they were they were just an interesting pair. I couldn't have had more interesting parents to give me a more interesting childhood. And I'm just so pleased to have been able to parlay it into a communication that can be read by other people. And thank you for so shamelessly promoting my book. I love that. But I, I, I do want to, I want to jump a little bit now because if people want to read more about it, just, just buy the book. But um, you also, I mean, the point is that you and your husband, Mark, actually went back to Ethiopia. I mentioned that in, in 74, when there was another huge, um, you know, uh, the, when the new government, um, uh, you know, took power, you actually were there, you were, I mean, you, you were in your last trimester, your husband fell ill, um, you guys were there while the shots were hanging out from the palace. Um, uh, uh, please tell us, why did you go back, number one, but also, I mean, one of the things that I'm, uh, uh, that I'm interested in is you are still, as we speak, you are still very much busy with development. And I mean, a little bit something else that we can speak about now is I know that even Sudan and South Sudan, which are also two very, very complex situations, you've also got, I want to call it fingers in the pie there. Um, but, but why did you choose to go back? I mean, it's a, um, I know you describe it in the book, but very briefly to people who haven't read the book, I mean, you, you know, as a, going back heavily pregnant, why? Um, is it just the, the, the clean air 8,000 feet up in Addis Ababa that drew you back or the people or the language? I mean, things changed very much while you were there um, as, a, as a mother. I mean, it, you actually lived yes. through very difficult times in Addis Ababa while, while you were a mother. Yes. Um, going back when I was pregnant, I was, only, I was only five months pregnant when I went back. Um, the, the, they called it a creeping coup. The, what, what became the communist takeover kind of began slowly in 74, but it was building up into violent power struggles. By 77, um, foreigners were not being, having their visas renewed. It was quite clear that folks were not gonna be able to continue. So it looked, that Christmas looked like the last chance to go back to Ethiopia. So all those things that you mentioned, the food, the spices, the, the mountain air, the language, the friends, and my family, my folks. It looked like this was the last time I thought ever I would be able to go back to Ethiopia. So it was no, it was no question. For somebody else, it might have seemed like, well, this is a bad time to travel to Ethiopia. For me, it, you know, when you grow up in a country, you don't feel nervous about it in the same way that someone who's unfamiliar would. So it just was not a question. 
And then my husband got hepatitis and was mm. very sick. Mm. So we ended up having to stay and, and having my daughter in Ethiopia. Um, but then the dream of going back to work was really a deeply buried one. I just didn't ever think it would be possible. And again, like my father out of the clear blue sky being invited to go to Ethiopia, it felt like the same thing happened. My brother had gone over to teach English. When he was leaving, they asked, do you know anybody who might be interested? And he said, call my sister. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> even at the time, I thought, boy, it's unlikely they'll let me go back. My brother's there. We were going to overlap for six months. My dad was there. Everybody remembers him. Are they going to really let me go back into this family situation that could be complicated? And it just, to me, was a huge gift that they did. So I went back and, and taught for six years. And then, as you're mentioning, they transferred us into, we lived in, Nairobi only because South Sudan was so deeply embroiled in their civil war. But I did a huge amount of traveling and development work back and forth in South Sudan, which is the, the subject of my second book, which is coming out in April. And I hope that um, it's going to be distributed in South Africa so as well. Would you do another interview with me on that one? <laughs> I, would, I would love to, yes, I definitely. Must read it first. Yes, yes. But, yes, but so yes. But but so I, 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 can we talk can we talk briefly about the development work because yes. as I say it's, it's ongoing. Um, I mean I'd you don't have to, to don't, don't give away your book now. But it's just that what what exactly are you are you doing? Because I mean one of the reasons why I contacted you is this is not just you know something that has happened and it's gone. You you know you while you are speaking to me from the United States, you actually are still actively involved in. In your in your roots um, where you grew up. Um, so what, what exactly are you doing? Um, in yes, in fact, I squeezed a Skype to phone call in with an Ethiopian engineer before I got on with you, because there's a new um, possibility of us raising money to get clean water to rural communities of about two thousand people. So I, my love of my my sweet memories of growing up in this very remote area, they have stuck with all of us, my, my siblings and myself. There was this idyllicness, I don't know if that's a word, in, the, um, in, in our early years <laughs> in Maji. So when, when I was there working in Addis Ababa, when things, when the communist regime fell apart enough and the rural areas began to open up, one of the first things I wanted to do was go back to Maji. And I then began going back and um, brokering development projects with churches in the United States and churches in parts of Ethiopia, including Maji. So because I kept showing up, eventually over a number of years, four years ago, I just began to believe that I wanted to start a nonprofit organization specifically for development in this rural area. The whole district of about 34,000 people has no nonprofit, no nonprofit organizations okay. work there. Oh. So I'm the only one. So, so the need was so clear and the possibility that all my years of working among Presbyterians and churches who are very generous that I could possibly raise money to do development specifically there just began to take root. And through the generosity, mostly Presbyterians uh, here in the United States, I have been able to do what I think is outsized work for such a young organization. Um, but we've, um, we've brought solar energy, it's off the grid. They're, the grid does, the Ethiopian grid doesn't extend that far. So solar home systems for families, we got a solar, um, a huge 33.6 kilogram kilowatt hour system put on the hospital, wow. which serves 60,000 people. It was just operating as a day clinic because they had no power. And, but people were so generous and we were able to get that done uh, during COVID. And now um, looking at some water projects, the global, um, supply chain issues are affecting me and, and that development work as well. So we're looking to harness 
and empower local energy and local materials for the benefit of people while we can't get anything imported. So it's just, it's just my heart. It's just my passion. Um, I get to use Amharic both Skype phone. And when I was able to travel, um, meeting with officials, meeting with community members, um, just being there, being with the Ethiopian people has, has been just a huge joy. But I mean, that's, that's kind of the point is that you, you are, you, you speak the language, you walk the walk, you, you know, you, it's, it is your roots as well. And that to me is actually one of the amazing things about your story. Um, mentioning yeah. water, there's a, there's a, in this book, there's a fascinating story about your father putting up a, a pump because you lived very high up on the hill. And I mean, you, you've just mentioned that, that he was a very good mechanic and he actually put up this incredible. So, I mean, you're actually following in dad's footsteps as well, being slightly crazy and doing weird, <laughs> wonderful things. Do you agree? <laughs> what can I say? I have to tell you a funny story about the language thing. Um, and so, so I replaced the pump my organization replaced the pump in the town. The townspeople suddenly were without clean water and they came to me. So, you know, I do this development work because people come to me with an issue. So when they were putting the new pump in, I was invited into town for uh, what I discovered was a little feast in a hole in the wall restaurant, which is the only kind there is. And all the town leaders had been invited to thank me. And um, so the Ethiopian Orthodox priest stood up and he said, I was told that a daughter of Maji had come back and had gotten uh, the pump and it was being replaced and would I come to help thank her? And I was very glad not realize until I walked in that she was white. Oh, wow, yeah. <laughs> Nobody, yeah, they had yeah. called me a daughter of Maji but hadn't explained that I was white. Well, these speeches were going on and I knew that my turn was going to come. So I said to my solar partner who speaks very good English, I said, um, translate for me. And he said, well, yes, but you have to greet people in Amharic first because my Amharic is broken, you know. So I greeted people and then I said, so that you don't have to listen to my broken Amharic, Jonas will translate for me. Mm -hmm. And everybody just burst out no, 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 no. We love your broken Amharic. Oh, wow, well, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> so great. I spoke in my broken Amharic to thank them for the collaboration and for the love that we, we share yeah. there in Maji. Wow. Caroline Kurtz, this was wonderful speaking to you. Um, and I this last bit actually just explains to everybody why I thought of you to explain the situation in Ethiopia. Thank you. Thank you for being who you are. Thank you for writing this wonderful book. And thank you for the work that you're doing. Um, now that you've mentioned the second book, I will look out for it. And hopefully in a few months from now, we could have another chat. Go well. That would be wonderful. And thank you so much for this interview. I appreciate thank you, Caroline. it.